Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. <clears throat> Today's topic is the 1929 Cleveland Indians AL MLB baseball season. <clears throat> Again, the Indians were playing in American Le- in the American League, the junior circuit of Major League Baseball, and home games were played at League Park at East 66th and Lexington in Cleveland. And the games uh, that year were on WTAM radio with Tom Manning, bro- the broadcaster. The Tribe had a, had a strong year in 1929. They finished in third place with a, winning perce- with a record of 81-71, and 71, winning percentage of 533. Pretty good. Uh, t- 24 games out of first and, and uh, 10 games over 500. The first place team was Connie Max, Philadelphia Athletics, who were 104-46 and 46, with, an, with, a, with an incredible winning percentage of 693. Second place, the New York Yankees were 88 and 66, 18 games out of first. Third place, the Cleveland Indians, 81 and 71. Fourth place, the St. Louis Browns were 79 and 73. Fifth place, the Washington Senators, 71 and 81. Sixth place, the Detroit Tigers, 70 and 84. Seventh place, the Chicago White Sox, 59 and 93. And in eighth and last place, the Boston Red Sox, 58 and 96. The uh, the Tribe was the most improved team in the in the American League from 1928. They had a strong finish and went 16 and 9 their last 27 games. On August 11th at League Park, Babe Ruth hit his 500th career home run. Wow! Against the Indians, Willis Hudlin. Construction of a Cleveland Municipal Stadium was delayed due to a taxpayer's lawsuit against the facility. On May 13th at League Park, the Indians and Yankees, the Indians and the Yankees were the first, became the first pro baseball teams to wear numbers on the backs of their uniforms. So that was really something. Before that, they didn't have uh, numbers. The tribe was in second place uh, with a pitching staff. The, the Tribe had the second-best pitching staff in the American League behind the Philadelphia Athletics. Spring training was in, in New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, the players, uh, as I said, the players finished third in, uh, third in, in the uh, American League. The, uh, and they also, as, as a third-place team, they, had a, they got a share under the, uh, under the uh, arrangements of World Series money. For finishing third, the, each player on the Indians received $700 of the World Series money. Attendance at League Park was 536,210, an average of 7,055. And that was up to 160,000 as more fans were coming to see a, the strong team. The Tribe had four scouts in 1929, including Cy Slapnica, who was born in 1886 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and died in 1979 in Cedar Rapids at age 93. He played in the major leagues himself, had a record of 1-6 as a pitcher, with an ERA of 4.30, 13 strikeouts. Slapnica played for the Chicago Cubs in 1911 and the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1918. He was a player for, the, for 18 years in the minor leagues, and uh, later was the Tribe general manager between 1935 and 1940. He was a Tribe scout from 1940 to 1961 and signed Hall of Famers Bob Feller and Bob Lemon. Cy Slapnica. Now, the other uh, scouts included Bill Rapp and uh, Bill Bradley, who had played for the Cleveland Blues, Cleveland Broncos, and Cleveland Naps between 1901 and 1910 and was the Cleveland Naps manager in 1909. And the fourth uh, scout was Charlie Piano Legs Hickman, played for the Cleveland Broncos and Naps between 1904 and ni- 1902 and 1904 and in 1908. Now the coaching staff included Grover Hart- Hartley, who uh, was a coach and a player, and he did some catching. He played. He hit 273, had nine hits and 33 at bats, scored two runs, had. Had a triple, eight RBIs, two walks in 24 games. Hartley was a Cleveland Indians player between 1929 and 1930 and a Cleveland coach between 1928 and 1930. Grover Hartley. Another coach was Howie Shanks, 
who was a coach with Cleveland between 1928 and 1932, Howie Shanks. Now, the, the, the manager for the tribe in 1929 was Roger Peckinpah, who had played for the Cleveland Naps in 1910 and then from 1912 to 1913. And he was the Cleveland Indians manager between 1928 and 1933 and in 1941. Roger Peckinpah. The starting uh, lineup, Luke Sewell was the catcher. Sewell batted 236 with 96 hits, uh, 41 runs, 16 doubles, 3 triples, a home run, 39 RBIs, 6 stolen bases, 29 walks in 124 games. And Sewell was with Cleveland from 1921 to 1932 and in 1939. In spring training, he had this to say, quote, If I could choose from the 16 clubs of both major leagues, I'd want to play with the Indians. They are going somewhere. Luke Sewell. Luke, Lou Fonseca was the first baseman. Fonseca batted 369. Wow. 209 hits, 97 runs scored. 44 doubles, 15 triples, 6 home runs, 103 RBIs, 19 stolen bases, and 50 walks. Wow. Best hitter in the American League, and he won the batting race. Highest batting average in 148 games. What an incredible year. 209 hits for Lou Fonseca, who was with Cleveland from 1927 to 1931. Lou Fonseca. Johnny Hodap was the second baseman. Hodap batted 327. With 19, 96 hits, 12 doubles, 7 triples, 4 home runs, 51 RBIs, 3 stolen bases, 15 walks in 90 games. And Hodap was with Cleveland from 1925 to 1932. Johnny Hodap. Ray Gardner was the shortstop. Gardner batted 262 with 67 hits. He scored 28 runs, had 3 doubles, 2 triples, a home run, 20. Four RBIs, 10 stolen bases, 29 walks in 82 games. Gardner was born in 1901 in Frederick, Maryland, and died in, 19, and died in 1968 at age 66. He played for the Cleveland Indians from 1929 to 1930. He batted 250, for his career, he batted 253 with 68 hits, 3 doubles, 2 triples, a home run, 25 RBIs, 10 stolen bases, 29 walks in 115 games, and he played the minor leagues for the Hagerstown Champs and the Frederick Hustlers. Ray Gardner. Joe Sewell was at third base. He'd been the long, long-time shortstop, but moved to th- third because his range was less. Sewell batted 315 with 182 hits. Really good. 38 doubles, 3 triples, 7 home runs, 73 RBIs, 6 stolen bases, 48 walks in 152 games. And Sewell was with Cleveland from 1920 to 1930. Joe Sewell. Charlie Jameson was in left field. He batted 291 with 106 hits, 56 runs scored, 22 doubles, a triple, 26 RBIs, two stolen bases, 50 walks in 102 games. Jameson was with Cleveland from 1919 to 1932. On May 11th at League Park, they had Charlie Jameson Day in 1929. The fans were given many pamphlets called Jamie, 11 Years of Loyal Hustling Service. And, well, they were called Jamie, and, the, and the, uh, some of the writing uh, in the pamphlet wrote this, quote, 11 years of loyal hustling services he has given to Cleveland, and the town is taking this opportunity at last to tell him his work hasn't gone unnoticed. Jameson was given a check for $3,200, which came from public contributions, in thanks for all his fine play over the years. In the eighth inning, there was a controversial call at that game, and the fans rioted. Thousands of pop bottles were thrown on the field, and one umpire, Emirate Ormsby, was knocked unconscious. Jameson grounded out to end the game. Later, Jameson said this to Cleveland Indians, Owner Alva Bradley, quote, Mr. Bradley, I'm scotch, and I like money as well as the next guy, but I give the whole $3,200 for one more hit off that monkey. He was talking about Lefty Grove. Charlie Jameson. Earl Averill was in center field. Earl Averill hit 332 with 198 hits, 110 runs scored. Wow, 43 doubles, 13 triples, 18 home runs. 96 RBIs, 13 stolen bases, 
63 walks in 152 games. Wow, the first year, Earl Averill's first year in Cleveland. He was born in 1902 in Snohomish, Washington, and died in 1983 in Everett, Washington, at age 81. For his career, Averill batted 318 with 238 home runs and 1,164 RBIs. He's actually my, fa- my father's favorite player as a boy. Averill played for the Cleveland Indians, Detroit Tigers, and Boston Braves between 1929 and 1941. He was a six-time All-Star between 1933 and 1938. The Tribe retired his number three. He's in the Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame, and he was inducted in- into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1975. He's the Tribe all-time leader in total bases, RBIs, runs, and triples. And it's for the Tribe, he's third all-time in hits, doubles, and a fourth all-time in home runs and walks. What a career. They called him the Earl of Snohomish. In the 1937 All-Star Game, he hit a line drive that broke Dizzy Dean's toe and helped led to the end of Dean's career. He's the first MLB player to hit four home runs in a doubleheader. He had a home run in his first MLB at bat on April 16, 1929, on opening day. There was an incident on July 1, 1935, in his career. Very unfortunate. He, he, he was lighting firecrackers, which exploded, which exploded while he was holding them, and there was a laceration of the fingers on his right hand and burns to his face and chest. He, he was out of action for several weeks, but made a full recovery. In 1937, he had temporary paralysis from a congenital spine condition, and after that had less power. He has 2019 career career hits. Really wonderful. Five five hit games. Wow. His son Earl Jr. was an MLB player from 1956 to 1963. Uh, Averill was a, he was a catcher, left fielder, and infielder. 1933, Averill hit for the cycle. In other words, a single, double, triple, and home run in one game. The tribe paid the San Francisco Seals of the, in the Pacific Coast League forty thousand dollars for Averill in the off season. Averill said this quote: "If I'm worth forty thousand dollars, I'm worth some money to myself." And he demanded and received a five thousand dollar bonus. He had one thousand eighty four RBIs with the tribe, and the only tribe player to have a thousand RBIs in the, in his career. He had the club record of 226 home runs, which stood for decade, decades. Averill said this in 1965, quote, I kept two things in mind at the plate. One, I was up there to swing. The other, to keep my eye on the target, which was the, which was the pitcher's cap. I always aimed for the middle. The base hits I swung for. The home runs came of themselves. In 1928, with the San Francisco Seals, Averill played in 189 games. He batted 354 and had 270 hits. Wow. Now, he had his 18 home runs, which he hit for Cleveland uh, in 1929, set a club record and broke Tris Speaker's record of 17. Earl Averill. Bib Falk was in right field. Falk batted 312 with 133 hits, 65 runs, 30 doubles, 7 triples, 13 home runs, 93 RBIs, 4 stolen bases, 42 walks, and 125 games. Falk was born in 1899 in Austin, Texas, and died in 1989 in Austin, Texas, also in Austin, at age 90. For his career, he batted 314, really good, 69 home runs, and 784 RBIs. Falk played for the Chicago White Sox and Cleveland Indians between 1920 and 1931. He was the tribe manager in 1933. Falk went to the University of Texas and played and played for the Longhorns football and baseball teams. When the 1919 Black Sox scandal broke, Falk replaced Shoeless Joe Jackson for the White Sox in left field. In 1926, he finished 12th in the MVP voting. He was a University of Texas Longhorns baseball coach from 1940 to 1942 and from 1942 to 1967. He's in the col- he won College World Series titles from 1949 and 1950. He's in the College Baseball Hall of Fame, and he also, in the minor leagues, uh, played for the Toledo Mudhands and also was a coach for them. Bib Falk. 
The bench players included Ed Morgan, who batted 318 with 101 hits, 60 runs, scored 19 doubles, 10 triples, 3 home runs, 37 RBIs, 4 stolen bases, 37 walks in 93 games, and Morgan was with Cleveland from 1928 to 1933. Ed Morgan. Jackie Tavener played some shortstop. They called him Rabbit. He batted 212 with 53 hits, 25 runs scored, 9 doubles, 4 triples, 2 home runs, 27 RBIs, a stolen base, 26 walks in 92 games. Tavener was born in 1897 in Salina, Ohio, and died in 1969 in Fort Worth, Texas at age 71. For his career, he batted 255 with 543 hits and 243 RBIs. Tavner played for the Detroit Tigers and Cleveland Indians from 1921 to 1929, so this was the end of his MLB career. He's one of four MLB players to steal second, third, in, and home in the same inning on multiple occasions, along with Ty Cobb, Honus Wagner, and Max Carey. He was one of the smallest MLB players ever, a top defensive shortstop. It's six seasons with the Fort Worth Panthers in the Texas League and won two Dixie Series titles in 1922 and 1924. He settled in Fort Worth, Texas, and owned a bowling alley called Taverner's Pladium. He was 5'5", 128 pounds, and in the minor leagues played for the Milwaukee Brewers. Jackie Taverner. Carl Lind played some second base. He batted 240 with 54 hits, 19 runs scored, 8 doubles, a triple, 13 RBIs, 13 walks in 66 games. And Lind was with Cleveland from 1927 to 1930. Carl Lind. Dick Porter was a utility player. Porter batted 328 with 63 hits, 26 runs scored, 16 doubles, 5 triples a home run, 24 RBIs, 3 stolen bases, 17 walks in 71 games. Porter was born in 1901 in Princess Anne, Maryland and died in 1974 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at age 72. For his career, he batted 308 with 11 home runs and 282 RBIs. Porter played for the Cleveland Indians and Boston Red Sox between 1929 and 1934. He had 14 seasons in the International League and hit 328 there with 123 home runs. He's in the International League Hall of Fame. In minor leagues, he played for the Baltimore Orioles, Birmingham Barons, Newark Bears, Syracuse Chiefs, Aniston Rams, and the Toronto Maple Leafs. They called him Twitchy Dick. The tribe bought Porter from, Bo- from the Baltimore Orioles in the International League for $30,000. He got his nickname Twitchy Dick because he twitched at the plate. He wiggled and twitched and got this unusual nickname, Twitchy Dick Porter. Glenn Myatt was a spare catcher. He batted 233 with 30 hits, 14 runs scored, four doubles, a triple, a home run, 17 RBIs, seven walks in 59 games. And Myatt was with Cleveland from 1923 to 1935. Glenn Myatt. Joe Hosser played some first base. Hosser batted 250 with 12 hits in 48 at bats. He scored eight runs, had a double, a triple, three home runs, nine RBIs. Four walks in 37 games. Hosser was born in 1899 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and died in 1997 in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, at age 98. For his career, he batted 284 with 80 home runs and 356 RBIs. Hosser played for the Philadelphia Athletics and Cleveland Indians between 1922 and 1929, so this was the end of his MLB career. They called him Unser Cho. In the minor leagues, he was the first player to hit 60 home runs twice. He hit 63 in 1930 and 69 in 1933. Uh, For the Milwaukee Brewers in the minor leagues, he was supported, playing for the Milwaukee Brewers in the minor leagues, he was supported by German-American fans who who used to say, quote, Das ist unser Joe, which is uh, German for that is our Joe. So unser Joe became his, uh, Cho became his nickname. After he retired, he ran a sporting goods shop in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. He's the only player to hit 60 home runs twice in pro baseball until Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa both accomplished that feat in 1998 and 1999. Hoster in the minor leagues played for the Providence Grays, the Baltimore Orioles, Kansas City Blues, and and Minneapolis Millers. Joe Hoster. 
Johnny Burnett was a middle infielder, play, playing shortstop and second base. He batted 152 with five hits and 33 at-bats. He scored two runs, had a double, two RBIs, a walk in 19 games, and Burnett was with Cleveland from 1927 to 1934. Johnny Burnett. Dan Jesse uh, got in one... Uh, got in one game, did not bat. He was born in 1901 in Olive Hill, Kentucky, and died in 1970 at age 69. And his MLB career was just with the Cleveland Indians in 1929, that one game which, in which he did not bat. Dan Jesse. Now, the pitching staff, the ace pitcher was Wes Farrell, who had an outstanding year. He was 21-10 and 10, with an ERA of 3.60. 43 games, 25 starts, 18 complete games, one shutout, five saves, 100 strikeouts, and 242 and two-thirds innings pitched. As a hitter, Farrell batted 237 with 22 hits, 12 runs scored, five doubles, three triples, a home run, 12 RBIs, a stolen base, a walk. He struck out 18 times in 47 games. Farrell was with Cleveland from 1927 to 1933. He was the second best pitcher in the American League after Philadelphia's George Earnshaw, and this was uh, who had his uh, who had it was having his rookie year. Wes Farrell, w- Willis Hudlin was 17 and 15 with an ERA of 3.34, 40 games, 30, 33 starts, 22 complete games, two shutouts, a save, 60 strikeouts, and 280 and one third innings pitched. Hudlin batted 196 with 19 hits. He scored five runs, had three doubles, four RBIs, a stolen base, a walk, and he struck out 18 times. And Hudlin was with Cleveland from 1926 to 1940. Willis Hudlin. Jake Miller was 14 and 12 with an ERA of 3.58. 29 games, uh, all starts. He completed 14 games at, and. Uh, 14 games, two shutouts, 206 innings pitched, and 58 strikeouts. Miller batted 200 with 15 hits. He scored six runs, had a double, three RBIs, two stolen bases, and struck out 10 times. And Miller was with Cleveland from 1924 to 1931. Dick Miller. Joe Schott was 8-8 with an ERA of 4.28. 26 games, 24 starts, 8 complete games, 43 strikeouts, in 162 innings pitched. Schott batted 293 with 17 hits and 58 at-bats. He scored four runs, had five doubles, seven RBIs, two walks, and struck out 11 times. And Schott was with Cleveland from 1922 to 1930. Joe Schott. Jimmy Zinn was 4-6 with an ERA of 5.04. 18 games, 11 starts, six complete games, a shutout, two saves, 29 strikeouts and 105 and one-third innings pitched. He hit 381. Wow, 16 hits and 42 at-bats. He scored seven runs, had four doubles, a triple, a home run, eight RBIs, four walks in 20 games. Zinn was born in 1895 in Benton, Arkansas, and died in 1991 in Memphis, Tennessee at age 96. For his career, he was 13-16 and 16 with an ERA of 4.30 and 108 strikeouts. Zinn played for the Philadelphia Athletics, Pittsburgh Pirates, and Cleveland Indians between 1919 and 1929. So this was the end of his MLB career. From 1923 to 1928, he pitched for the Kansas City Blues and won 20 games three times for them. In 1923, he was 27 and 6. He was a manager in the minor leagues off and on until 1953. In the minors, he played for the Fort Smith Twins, the Waco Navigators, the Wichita. Taw Falls, Sputters, San Francisco Seals, El Paso Texans, Jacksonville Jacks, and Sioux City Cowboys. Jimmy Zinn. Johnny Miljus was 8-8 eight eight with an ERA of 5.19, 34 games, 15 starts, 4 complete games, 2 saves, 42 strikeouts, and 128 and one third innings pitched. Miljus batted 256 with 11 hits and 43 at-bats. Scored seven runs, had four doubles, a triple, five RBIs, and struck out 12 times. And Miljus was with Cleveland from 1928 to 1929, and this was the end of his MLB career. Johnny Miljus. Ken Holloway was 6-5 and five with an ERA of 3.03. 25 games, 11 starts, 6 complete games, 
two shutouts, 32 strikeouts, and 119 innings pitched. Holloway hit 171 with seven hits and 41 at bats. He scored a run, had two doubles, an RBI, and a walk. Holloway was born in 1897 in Thomas County, Georgia, and died in 1968 in Thomasville, Georgia, at age 71. For his career, he was 64 and 52 with an ERA of 4.40 and 293 strikeouts. Holloway pitched for the Detroit Tigers, Cleveland Indians, and New York Yankees between 1922 and 1930. He was on the University of Georgia Bulldogs baseball team in 1924 and 1925. For two years, he was 27 and 10. I'm sorry, between 1924 and 1925, he was 27 and 10, the top MLB pitcher for those two years combined. Ken Holloway. Milt Schaffner was 2 and 3 with an ERA of 5.04, 11 games, 3 starts, a complete game, 15 strikeouts, and 44 and 2 thirds innings pitched. Schaffner batted 15 times and did not have a hit. He scored a run and struck out twice. Schaffner was born in 1905 in Sherman, Texas, and died in 1978 in Madison, Ohio, at age 72. For his career, he was 25 and 26 with an ERA of 4.59 and 180 strikeouts. Schaffner pitched for the Cleveland Indians, Boston Bees, and Cincinnati Reds between 1929 and 1940. So he was a rookie in 1929. In the minor leagues, he played for the Grand Rapids Black Sox, the Rochester Tribe. Jersey City Skeeters, Toledo Mudhens, Scranton Miners, Newark Bears, and Memphis Chickasaws. Milt Schaffner. George Grant was 0-2 with an ERA of 10.50. 12 games, 5 strikeouts in 24 and 1 third innings pitched. He batted twice and did not have a hit. He was with Cleveland from 1927 to 1929, so this was the end of his time in Cleveland and continued in the major leagues until 1931. George Grant. Mel Harder was 1-0 with an ERA of 5.60, 11 games, 17 and two-thirds innings pitched, and four strikeouts. He batted once, did not have a hit, and he struck out in that one at bat. Mel Harder was with Cleveland from 1928 to 1963 as a player, manager, and coach. Mel Harder. Clint Brown was 0-2 with an ERA of 3.31, three games, a start, which he completed one strikeout in 16 and one-third innings pitched. Brown batted seven times, did not have a hit, and scored a run. Brown was with Cleveland from 1928 to 1935 and from 1941 to 1942 and is buried at the Lakewood Cemetery in Rocky River, Ohio. Clint Brown. And finally, Jim Moore had no decisions in an ERA of 9.53, two games and five and two-thirds innings pitched. He batted twice and did not have a hit. Moore was with Cleveland from 1928 to 1929, so this was the end of his time in Cleveland. He continued in the major leagues until 1932. Jim Moore. Now, in the 1929 World Series, the National League champions, Chicago Cubs, were defeated by the American League champions, Philadelphia Athletics, four games to one. The Hall of Famers in the... Associated with this team for the club, Cubs included Joe McCarthy, the manager, and players Kiki Kyler, Gabby Hartnett, Rogers Hornsby, and Hack Wilson. For the Athletics, Connie Mack, the manager, was in, a, in the Hall of Fame, along with players Mickey Cochran, Jimmy Fox, Lefty, Lefty Grove, Eddie Collins, and Al Simmons. And, also, and, and an umpire who officiated in this series is also in the Hall of Fame, Bill Clem. That's the story of the 1929 World Cleveland Indians. They had a good year. Uh, They were a year to be proud of. God bless the fellows who played for the Cleveland Indians in 1929 and everyone else associated with the team, including the fans, especially the Civil War veterans, Spanish-American War veterans, and First World War veterans. Captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp Statue, and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, a Cleveland Museum of Art Enthusiasts, First Energy Stadium Friends, Progressive Field Pals, Quicken Loans Arena Enthusiasts, Tribe, uh, Cleveland is the best location in the nation on the north coast of America. 
New York is the Big Apple. Cleveland is a plum. Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, and Gladiators rule. Cleveland's City of Champions. Before you know it, it'll be opening day 2019. Go Tribe. You might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at PeterJRay.com. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.